All right, looks like we're uh, recording. So today is Wednesday, March 19th, and we just got done with the test discussion, and we're going to move on to announcements now. And in fact, I'm actually quite excited that there are a number of interesting events coming up. So look, look uh, in the Facebook group for those. So there's um, the PyCon warm-up. So thanks to both of you for uh, sharing that. And then there is um, the one that you mentioned. Uh, can you say a couple of words about this? Yeah, well, it's run by Built in Chicago. They're kind of, I wouldn't call it, they're like, um, I would call it like a social hub for the startup scene in Chicago, I guess. And they're running an event where it's like a launch party, I guess. They're having five startups give presentations of what their company is, but it's also just like a general networking event and food and drink and stuff like that. That's great. Well, thanks. Yeah, so... Um, it's great to be in an environment where there's so much activity. You know, it's, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, I, I recommend taking advantage of, of these opportunities as, as you see fit and as they match your interests. So, and I think it's also good because we, we missed out on the uh, ACM talk, which was canceled, so at least this is kind of a way to make up for, for that. Um, so th the other thing, uh, where I sent out more of a broadcast um, announcement was for the Go to Chicago. And um, so uh, th it's the student volunteer opportunity. Has anyone from, from this group uh, signed up for that? Oh, okay, thank you. So, um, yeah, that conference is um, in the third week of May. And it's also focused on, on agile development, pretty much, and um, state-of-the-art uh, tools and techniques, languages, et cetera, for development. Great. Um, so you should have gotten that sent to your Loyola email through um, our general announcement list. I sent that out about, uh, I think, yesterday uh, afternoon or so. All right. Um, that's all I have in terms of announcements. Let's look at this part here briefly, uh, Scala Z, as they pronounce it. And um, this is a library that we're already using in part, and I already showed uh, a, f a few examples. I just wanted to recap. So Scala Mu is a very, very thin layer with just a few lines of new executable code on, on top of Scala Z, okay? So the reason for the existence of Scala Mu is to enable me to teach these recursive, these explicitly recursive types, meaning where the recursion is expressed by applying this Mu combinator, which is like a type level version of the Y combinator for functions which are values, it's for me to be able to teach this in more of an isolated way than in this kind of more overwhelming context of, of Scala Z, where it's easier to get lost, okay? And I just wanted to encourage everybody to kind of, you know, think of Scala Z as these additional batteries that allow you to take Scala to another level. And um, I would maybe say it like this. You know, and it's really only a loose analogy. So when you, when you do C++, and correct me if I'm wrong, because you're, you're the resident expert here, right? So when, when you work with C++, you're likely to work also with uh, the standard template library for many things, right? Or something similar, right? Uh, but I think now the STL has um, pretty much taken taken off and um, uh, has become the standard, probably even on Windows, right? Where there used to be these other uh, versions of vectors and other stuff, and STL pretty much has has taken over. Um, but then it doesn't end there, right? So when you want to do more advanced 
stuff in C++, what do you use? What libraries? There are actually libraries for, for example, like for the graphics. If, if, mm -hmm. if you want to do graphics programming, you, you have this like GT K plus. Oh, okay. So those are more more specific, right, to certain tech technical domains. But there, there's also a, a set of advanced general libraries that go beyond the the STL. Like the standards library itself, like it's like STL is part of it. Sure. No. The, so the STL is a very a general but basic um, standard library, right, with collections and algorithms and things like that. But but there's one. Uh, are you familiar with one called the Boost library? The for C++ exactly. So that you know, if you're not and and you work with C++, you should, you should definitely check it out. So the Boost library takes C++ to another level. I mean, it has abstractions that um, the STL doesn't address or, or, or attempt to provide. You know, this is the STL is your your basic batteries, so to speak, and then the Boost library is f for things that were now recently, um, or some of which were recently incorporated in the language definition, such as lambda expressions and things like that. So the Boost library has for uh, earlier versions of C++ had, uh, for example, lambda expressions and a, a whole range of other interesting uh, additional things, but that, that are still fairly um, independent of specific technical domains such as graphics development. Is that accurate? The folks in the back who are familiar with this, right? So there are lambda expressions, there are a few other things, right? So I would um, I would say Scala Z is to Scala a little bit like what the Boost libraries are to uh, to C++. Perhaps I mean that's a loose analogy, okay? And you know what does it give you? So one thing that you've noticed I'm sure is what's absent in and I mentioned it at the beginning. You know what's absent from Java, and what's also absent from the the Scala standard libraries, there's, there's no tree uh, data structure, okay? Um, and there are certain other abstractions that, that are implicit in the Scala API, such as functor, you know, so there are different things that have a map method, so option supports map, obviously list, uh, sequence, stream, etc., support map. But you cannot write a function that says the argument needs to be anything that supports map, and then I take that argument and apply map to it. You can't write that with just the regular, you know, the standard Scala library. Okay. What abstraction expresses this that now you're familiar with? The idea that something has a map method. Functor, exactly. That's right. So you need a way to to refer to that abstraction. You need to say something like, um, ma you know, function the function I'm defining, and then I need to say, well, uh, if if uh, the type t is a functor and I have an argument x of that type t, then I can apply map to x. No matter you know, what, then I could even put a sh shape f in there. Does that make sense? So if, if, I cannot give, if I cannot refer to it, if it doesn't have a name, I cannot use it as an abstraction. So that's kind of the downside of the standard Scala API. But the upside is, as I had mentioned also, that the type system is powerful enough to express those kinds of things. And Scala Z leverages that, okay? So when you look at the Scala Z, again, the, the documentation is not uh, tutorial style, you know, so it's not gentle, okay? So the Scala Z documentation is not what gets you started with Scala Z. It's 
really only for for reference and it's even not necessarily as effective for those so uh for those purposes you know so nevertheless it's useful to take a quick look and we'll go to the index page here and let's see yep so we we'll press here and it basically says you know on that first line it says okay there are or here are these items even these bullet items there are type class definitions and then there are data structures and then there's related stuff okay so the type class again we've uh, come across this term a few times lately um and a type class is a concept that that is a key part of Haskell, of the Haskell type system. So broadly speaking, Scala Z brings you these nice structures and type class abstractions from Haskell into Scala. Okay. So especially this is particularly appealing, I think, to people who might have coded in Haskell before moving to Scala or who are doing both or so. You know, in my case I was using Haskell before Scala was even around, okay? So, so in fact, um, in the early 90s, Martin and I were looking at some, some extensions to the Haskell type system that um, involved type classes, okay? So, um, you know, at this point, though, so more than 20 years later, you know, am I writing a lot of Haskell code? No, I made this conscious decision to use Scala for this course, mostly for pragmatic reasons, you know, because in Scala we can study these concepts, we can study purely functional approaches, uh, we can study these uh, advanced type-based abstractions while at the same time being more tied to the actual um, the development community in a more pragmatic sense, okay? So we're, we're compatible with the JVM. Um, there's a lot of activity surrounding Scala. Um, you know, there are some good projects in Haskell, but there's just more activity and more momentum in Scala for a number of reasons. So that's why I thought Scala Z was a really great thing because it brings those things back into Scala and allows us to work with Scala at, at a more advanced level. Now back to these specific things. So type classes are basically these kinds of abstractions like functor or monoid. Um, that uh, describe certain behaviors that types that belong to the type classes are expected to have. So type class functor here, okay, type class functor, instances, option, list, stream, our own shape f, my NAT F example, expert F, you know, so you've seen a bunch of examples. Okay. Monoid, I'm about to show that little example that um, we had some time ago. And now I'm going to just give, a, uh, you know, uh, give you a, a chance to look at it based on what you've seen so far. Um, so, but those are type classes. And then there are data structures, so let me just show you some of those. And one will appear familiar. So, you know, there's advanced uh, algebraic stuff, you know, like these slightly things. It sounds very intimidating, but it's not even that big of a deal. You know, but the ones that are really ready for us to use immediately are tree, for example. Um, there's a heap one. I haven't used it yet, you know, but it looks promising. I mean, if it's a proper heap structure. 
And then there's Scala Z validation, which is uh, kind of an enhancement of option in, in a loose sense that you can use to, uh, you know, for computations where things can go wrong and you might want to, um, for example, if multiple things can go wrong, you might want to collect the um, information about everything that has gone wrong. You might not want to stop at the first thing that goes wrong. You know, when does this happen, for example? Well, if you have a long form, you as a user would probably be, and rightfully be upset if, let's say, you, you fill out the whole form and you make multiple mistakes and it only tells you about the first one. And okay, let's go back, correct it, and resubmit it. And so, oh, this one's also wrong. You know, you'd rather know immediately everything that's wrong and correct it and then resubmit it once, right? So for that kind of thing, you can benefit from, let's say, a validation which, um, you know, unlike option, which basically the first time the failure occurs and you get the none, from then on, everything, every, you know, the remaining steps will not have an effect. But if you use something like this validation structure, you can do it in such a way that the, that um, it can continue trying some of the steps and accumulate the failure information. So it will give you the whole picture of everything that might have failed in this attempt or sequence of steps. Okay, and then there's this monad stuff that maybe we'll explore later this semester. There's a D list, which is some kind of functional, some efficient functional data structure. There's some advanced thing called a finger tree, which I'm not really familiar with yet. Anyway, so there are a bunch of data structures that are not in the, sta the standard Scala API. And now back to the type classes, okay. Um, so we know functor and there are a few others. Um, a lot of these are not going to make sense initially. You know, but let's look a little bit more at you know, what a type class is and how this is different from a, a regular, like a trait. Because so we can say, well, functor says, okay, the classes or, or types that are instances of functor, they have to have a map method. Let's look at, at functor. So abstract value members, you know, that's basically the thing that you need to override or provide for something to be a functor. And they're concrete ones. Why are these concrete? Well, because they are, they can be provided even with map still being abstract, you know. So these are, these, this is basically the code that all functors reuse. So these, these are functions that are already implemented or methods that are already implemented. The abstract one, is the one that when you want to make something a functor instance, you have to say how the map works for that. And remember when you did the shape F, um, you provided the map and then it became a functor instance. So that's why that one, you know, cannot implement that. You have to say, you have to define that map behavior. Okay, so you saw it in shape F, you saw it here in the um, tower F, from the uh, test, etc. How is this different from a trait that says subtypes of that trait have to have map? This is the this is the crucial difference here, and, and this is kind of a a little bit of the punchline. You know why it's useful to have type classes. Okay. Um, Let's look at a really simple example that you've probably used in the past. So you're, you're familiar with this interface, right? A comparable interface. What, what does this do? Can anyone summarize briefly what this is good for? Yep. So you can, this, this actually, Gives you one method to compare to, mm -hmm. and then when you implement it, you have to, yeah, when you use the interface, you have to implement the compare to, and then the compare to returns p val, the 
one of three possible values, negative one or zero or one. Right. Or even yeah. less than zero, greater than zero, or zero, right? And zero meaning it's equal. Yeah, yeah zero is equal, and negative, a negative number means that the, the, the object on the left is less than the object mm -hmm. on the right, and the positive number means that the one on the right is Exactly. So it, it gives you a way to um, to define an ordering on on a, a type, right? So um, that's right. And um, let's say our those towers with the platforms. Let's say we want to have an, an ordering on those, right? What do we do? You know, let's say if we had a Java version of that. So we say class tower, or, or somehow let's say tower is an interface, right? Because that's our our super type. So interface tower. What do we need to do then? That's right. Extends comparable, and then we need to stick tower in here as well. And then we need to implement the compare to because that's in the interface comparable, meaning it's uh, an abstract method. So we have to implement it before, I mean, we have to implement it in subclasses or implementing classes of, of tower so that we can actually, we can consider those to be concrete classes and we can instantiate them. That's right. Okay, very good. So, first question. So, obviously, comparable was was created by the designers of the Java API, and they would not be able to predict that you were going to write this tower class or tower class hierarchy, right? So, does comparable know anything about tower? No, it it couldn't, right? It makes no sense. That's right. So, the the interface doesn't know about um, possible implementation classes because it's kind of it's an assumption that that set is open of possible implementations. Okay. So what about the other way around? Does um, Tower know about comparable? It must know about it, and it, that's why it has to say I'm extending. Comparable, so there is an explicit connection there, a relationship, right? There's an explicit. It's an isa or realizes or whatever you want to call it. I don't like to go into that much detail, so we'll just say it's an isa relationship between tower and comparable, and the isa relationship is asymmetric, right? So the the subtype knows about the supertype. Okay, what does that mean, though? Can I now? Take, let's say, a Java interface, and then can I take some other existing Java class, and can I say, so I have interface I, okay, and I have class C, and both of these already exist. Can I then connect these? Can I do this? Can I create a, some kind of is a relationship here after the fact? Um, right. But that's not, that's not really a relationship between C and I. It's that's between, between the subclass, subclass, right. So this I cannot do, and let's look at the implications of this. That's a, a good discussion. So I could do subclass or subtype. You know, if C is an interface, it doesn't matter. Let's say I can do some kind of um, subtype, and then this one I can then relate here. Okay. But, so what? what is the implication? What are the ramifications? Let's say I have a, a whole bunch of behaviors or functionality in terms of C. Okay. And um, then to use that, 
I would have to basically stick in a, a D, and I would ho have to hope that the, that functionality is general enough so I get out Ds wherever there would be Cs in the original, and then I, I would still be able to treat those as, you know, I could cast them back to a D and then uh, use whatever is in I, okay? But I'm not able to, um, let's say, suppose there are some existing instances of C. I, I cannot um, extend their behavior with stuff that I requires uh, in such a way that, let's say, those existing instances or or even certain other existing um, capabilities would work with respect to I. Does that make sense? So meaning I cannot really, um, I cannot create a direct relationship after the fact. Okay. So there is this asymmetry, meaning the subtype that uh, implements or extends the interface has to have a direct relationship with the interface. Okay. I cannot take, so that means that relationship has to be built into that type. I cannot take a pre-existing type that doesn't have a relationship with an interface and then create a direct relationship with that. I would have to do this kind of indirect stuff with some workarounds and kludges. Um, and depending on how the existing code is written, it might or might not work. So, for example, if you have code that produces new instances of C, if I wanted to use them in conjunction with I, I would have to somehow, you know, create these based on those Cs and then use the behavior from I. But it wouldn't work directly on those instances of C. So it's, it can be a dead end. So when you have interfaces, the implementing or extending types have to know about the interface. Whereas, let's look at the type classes. So, so there's this type class functor. Who needs to know about functor? Well, functor obviously doesn't know about your shape f or, or my nat f or my exper f or anything like that. You know, so that's the same as uh, comparable not knowing about classes that implement comparable. Does that make sense? Now, what about the other way around? So we were able to take a shape f, little type hierarchy, that didn't say anything about functor in its definitions. And then we were able to say separately, okay, let's relate the two. You, uh, you actually did this in your project 2B, right? So there was a point where you said, Let's now take our shape F and its implementing classes and as a completely separate step, you know, without having to go back and modify the definitions of shape F and its variants, we could relate shape F and functor. And the relationship was established. So the type classes allow you to do these kinds of extensions. It's a genuinely open world um, assumption in the sense that you can take existing um, types, you can take these existing abstractions, these type classes, and then you can express a, a specific relationship of the type with the type class by saying, for example, shape, I want shape F to be a functor instance, and here is the corresponding required map behavior. Okay, so that's how it works, for example, in Haskell. That is the, the essence of type classes. But there's an additional thing you can do. 
you can say, well, over here, the relationship between shape F and functor should work ba uh, based on this map implementation. And then somewhere else you could say, well, over here, I want shape F to implement functor with a different map implementation. So I could even have multiple relationships and I could decide which ones I want to be active in my in my scope. So it's it's very powerful and flexible. So from a software engineering point of view, okay, the ability to create these relationships even after the fact is actually very powerful and useful. So that's that's the main uh strength here, I would say, the, the main advantage of type classes as a, an abstraction mechanism. Any comments? Questions? So let's take a quick look at, just so you see more than one, um, let's say, example, uh, easily accessible example of um, a type class in practice. Let's look again at monoid, right? And I think you know we we did discuss what a monoid is. So a, a monoid is uh, mathematically speaking a, a semi-group with a neutral element. And what that means is, so semi-group means there's an associative uh, binary operation in such a way that the semi-group semi is closed under that operation, meaning, let's say, if you take two um, elements of the semi-group, you know, two elements A and B, for any two elements, and you say A operation B, the result is still a member of the semi-group. So that means it's the operation, or the semi-group is closed under that operation. And then um, the neutral element with respect to that operation means that, so let's call it zero. So if you do A op zero, it's A, and the same thing, zero op A, you still get A. So that's a neutral element. So up there is an example, okay? Um, so the when you use the Scala Z monoid syntax, the neutral element is this kind of zero or like a circle with, with a slash through it. And the associative operation is this plus between the two vertical bars. Okay. And you can access the neutral element for um, a particular monoid instance by, by just providing the type of that monoid instance as, as an uh, argument, so it's a generic value, okay? So zero slash um, for int is the actual int value zero, so this assertion would pass, and then using uh, the vertical bar plus vertical bar uh, on the int values, you know, that maps to just integer plus. Okay. Now, there is a, another monoid based on int if you choose a different operation than plus. You could say, oh, I want, I want the monoid that's based on integer multiplication. And what would then be the neutral element for that? One, one exactly. So if you choose that one, and there, there's a syntactic way to do it with something called tags. There's some mechanism for it. I don't know offhand what the syntax is, but it's in that reference I'm going to show you shortly. Then it would say, well, for that uh, choice of operation that makes int a monoid, the neutral element would be 1. And you would get actually multiple, you know, the vertical bar plus vertical bar would map to multiplication. You could do that. You could make that choice. But the default is uh, zero and plus. So then there are a few other monoid instances right there. One is, um, and I mentioned all of these. It's just that here you're actually seeing the code. So the neutral element for list is the empty list. And the 
operation is list concatenation, just appending the two lists to each other. And then same thing, string neutral, neutral element could be the empty string, and string, um, you know, the operation would be string concatenation. Now, I'm going to show briefly this uh, idea that when you have an abstraction like that, that you have a name for, and you can use in the type of, of your code, of your methods or you know, parametric uh, abstractions, then you have enormous uh, expressive power and at the same time you're able to write code that's very general, meaning you, you'd have to use a lot less, you, you'd have to write a lot less code. So suppose I want something, and this is the example we had uh, discussed informally a few weeks ago. So suppose I want to take a value and I want to basically apply this operation to the value with itself. Okay, so for integer, it would be duplicating the value, you know, so if x is, if, if t is int and x is 3, I would get 3 plus 3, okay? So here, so duplicating 3 would, would be 6, duplicating the list 1 through would be concatenating that with itself, okay? And then duplicating hello would be hello appended to itself. And Normally, you would, you would expect to write three different um, methods, you know, because you don't really have um, a way to express this idea of, of a monoid as an abstraction, okay? But in Haskell and Scala, you have this capability called higher-kinded types where you can say, well, the monoid is really, um, it's a type class, which in Scala you represent as a, a type constructor. And if you say, well, if T is an instance of that, um, the type class represented by this type constructor, which is kind of a shorthand for saying there is a, an implicit, you know, like the one we defined for functor, where we say, well, there is a place where for the type T, that the concrete type T, there's a place somewhere where it says what this operation and the neutral element mean for that type. So here, how do we get them? Well, Scala Z provides instances for common types. And the way Scala Z is structured, and that's the part that um, took me a while to, to learn, especially for Scala Z version 7. So Scala Z allows you to import uh, data structures and um, type classes directly you know, at the top level. So there's monoid, there's uh, yeah, as, a, as a type class, there's functor as a type class, etc. And then there's tree as a data structure, et cetera. Okay, but that gives you, so tree is a concrete data structure, right? But monoid or functor are these uh, abstractions, and there aren't necessarily any instances. How do you get instances? Well, there are these things called Scala Z dot standard dot whatever that give you for specific uh, types or group of types instances of the main type classes that Scala Z gives, you know, where, where applic applicable. So when I say Scala Z dot standard dot any val, this gives me the applicable type class instances for the basic types. So the any val corresponds to int, boolean, float, you know, that sort of stuff, your, your scalar, your, your scalar types your basic types, okay? So when I do uh, Scala Z standard dot any val import, I automatically get, for example, monoid instances for the types where those make sense, including int, okay? And then 
when I pull in the standard instances for spring, string, I get, for example, um, the monoid instance for string, and I get a bunch of other instances applicable to string. And then the same thing for list, okay? So here I get functor instance for list, I get monoid instance for list, etc. And then there's a separate area called syntax. So the syntax, that's where I get the zero with a slash and the, uh, the special operator symbol, okay? And, um, you know, and the equal, you've seen that gives us the assert equal. So if I got rid of the, one of the syntax ones, then either the assert or these other monoid things wouldn't work. Anyway, so the, the point that I'm trying to make here is that by having these higher kind of abstractions, you can um, greatly enhance the generality and thereby the extent of reuse of your code. So this x um, vertical bar plus vertical bar x replaces um, different versions of this duplicate idea for different kinds of structures. And here you can, because we can actually express an abstraction as general as, let's say, monoid, we can just write a single version of this. And it works. You, know, you will see, I'll run it. Or I can do an append all. I can do a fold left where I start, where E is the monoid. I start with uh, the neutral element for that as the starting point. And then I just concatenate those things. So this tells me, for example, if I have a... Okay, got to wrap up now. So if I have, um, let's say, an option, and uh, if I have a non value of option int, that's the case where there aren't any values and I should get the neutral element for int. So E becomes int here. Or if I have sum three, then int E is int also but I have that one item because sum is like a list of length one. None is like a list of length zero. Sum is like a list of length one. So I add them all up, well, but there's only one, so I get that one, right? Um, and this is very much like a reduce, you know, where I have a default, um, default uh, result. Um, so it's a reduce, this is like a reduce that works even on an empty collection, right? And then if I have list one, two, three, E is also int, but, but the monoid, um, the traversable is list, okay? Here the traversable is option, there the traversable is list, and there the traversable is list, but E is list of int, and that means I get basically this um, flat structure here. So the append all is kind of, appending it to a single flattened collection. Okay, and then, you know, I can do a few other things. And then here's this really cool part that I mentioned where you can import these laws and it'll do property-based checking where it checks, for example, that for a whole bunch of different int values, the monoid laws, which mean the law for associativity you know, these mathematical properties for associativity and for the, what it claims to be a neutral element to actually be a neutral element, whether those laws are satisfied. So let me, let me run this. And uh, let's see. Where, where do I need to go? Here, 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 here. So SPT console. Well, this one might actually run inside the IDE. Let's give it a try. Is it doing it? Yeah, that's the question. Now it's doing it. Yeah, see, there is some issue. That there's still a glitch in the... Um, 
IntelliJ IDEA worksheet um, compiler that prevents this perfectly good code from working. You know, so we'll just have to do it like this. So low, you know, it's still good to have a syntax directed editor. It's just we cannot hit that run button. So let's say examples, um, monoid. That's why it's only in Scala Mu with that substructure. Here we go. Okay. It's doing it, its thing. And all the assertions are passing, as you see. And then now the uh, properties. See how that one invocation of check, you know, it causes the generation of all these possible values and the test of these values, like the associative law, and the identity law, left and right identity, you know, zero plus A or A plus zero. So for each for each monoid instance it does these three it checks these three laws. So this is for int, this is or one is for you know, int, list and string. Okay. So all right. Um, now just to summarize, you know, and we'll we'll get started with uh, you know project three discussion uh, in the forum. Uh, we'll you know we'll manage the deadline accordingly. I mean, it's it's uh, going to be the next challenge, of course. Um, one thing, just I wanted to to mention very briefly. So there's a thing called typelevel.org, which is kind of an umbrella for various advanced uh, Scala libraries, and you see Scala Z as part of it, and then there are various other useful ones. So Scala Check is the one that we use to check those laws that you just saw. But there, there are other interesting ones. Oh, spec, Specs 2 is a um, kind of specification-based um, testing library. And then Shapeless, explores this idea of uh, generic programming of these very general reusable abstractions to a, a greater degree. And then there's also this um, numeric one, which uh, focuses more on the mathematical parts. Um, so all of these, I think, are hosted on, on GitHub. I know for sure, uh, you know, Specs2, no question about it, Shapeless, uh, Spire as well. So these are all also on on GitHub, you know, just as some starting points. We're not going to go into any more detail here. We have to come back and focus on this very other, this very important set of topics, which is uh, representing and interpreting uh, actual programs. You know, and that's what Project Three is about. Anyway, so let's take a very very short break. You know, a couple of minutes. Uh, and allow the presenters to transition. And we're going to start with who, who, who wants to go first? You want to go first? Yeah, Sorry, hmm? yeah. yeah? Okay, great. And again, so I, we have a VGA.